Welcome back to the Sorian's Wardrobe YouTube channel. I am Mariana, and it has been far too long since I've posted any videos, so I'm really excited to be back posting a new video for you all, and hopefully this one will be really interesting and you learn something. So to kick off some new videos, I decided to cover the history of corsets, or as I have said multiple times in previous videos, they are actually called stays, but you know, YouTube algorithm. We're going to call them corsets for the most part. <laughs> I'm going to kind of talk about what it's like wearing one on a regular basis. Um, and also kind of talk to you about the history and sort of the transition that corsets and stays made in the 19th century and into the 20th century. So stays or corsets were actually sort of like the start of Western fashion. So the West Western fashionable silhouette and the things that we recognize as historical fashion today, um, a lot of it came out of like France and England and Western Europe. Um, so there have been different terms for clothing items and things throughout the centuries that have kind of changed meanings as a lot of things have. So for instance, corset, actually you can find corsets earlier back than like the medieval times, um, but those were not the corsets that we know today. So though they did have corsets, they were not what we visualize and they were actually more like a cloak and they were worn by men. So the term corset kind of had a revamp. So the earliest form of a corset or a stay is actually can be found in the 1300s. So in the 1300s, um, it was not boned. It wasn't very supportive necessarily, but it was laced and that would kind of cinch in the waistline. Then corsets or stays kind of have changed from the 1300s and then they became more boned and it was fully boned to where it's just like boning, 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 boning. There wasn't any like, you know, you manipulating in the use of the garment to actually create the form, like with the fabric and stuff. Like they just wanted the support of the boning because really corsets were an early form of a bra. That's all it was really. However, for this video, I'm actually going to really begin right before the start of the 19th century, and then I'll go throughout the 19th century, and I'm going to be talking primarily about the corsets in that time period. So a corset as the supportive undergarment that we know it as, um, that didn't become more of the commonplace until the 1790s, like the way that we visualize it for the silhouette, I guess. So in the 1790s, the corsets were actually much more similar to what we have as like a bra, kind of like a sports bra. Um, they were shorter. Um, often they were corded, made with cottons and linens and twills, um, but they were not like heavily boned and stuff like these super supportive things. They are actually more soft material and really just kind of for holding you in and getting that correct silhouette um, and not necessarily for like trying to cinch your waistline because it didn't even really go down to your natural waistline. <sighs> so then we get to 1810 and then we have a more supportive um, corset or pair of stays and um, these had more than just the cording, they had more boning. So the Regency period, they still had, you know, that cloth, the soft cloth, it was still lightweight, it was still short, but there was more support to it. But the support of the bust and that is more like they made cups and cut around, and it's like just a thin layer of fabric covering it. But it like, it lifts. It still supports. Um, it's just not the same as like the full boning corset that you're used to with Victorian fashion. So they didn't need a longer, they didn't need longer stays because the the ampere waistline 
was what was in fashion so they didn't need him to be super long and cover because it was all loose and comfortable <laughs> so it was ideal for eating massive quantities of food all right <laughs> moving on so the style of gowns between 1810 and 1830 progressively um got lowered the waistline so as the waistline moved down sleeves got bigger the silhouette changed even more and actually the silhouette that we start to see the stays becoming by the 1830s are much more boned much more supportive and there is um, much more emphasis on bringing in the waistline because by the 1830s the waistline was not all the way down to the natural waistline point but it was actually like right above it so kind of like I don't know the bottom of your rib cage who knows <laughs> so when Queen Victoria became the Queen of England the fashion changed dramatically she is the one that really popularized the use of hoop skirts and um, the changing of the silhouette becoming more of the hourglass and it actually leaves more um, a lot more room and ability for you to move and breathe in the Victorian era because they actually like they got the shape they want their body to be using this highly supported boned undergarment so the shape and the support that the stays actually provided between 1830 and then moving into the 1860s was actually not too dramatically different as you can tell there are a lot of similarities um, in the silhouette but it becomes more defined more dramatic as the century moves on so the silhouette and the look of a corset or stay by the 1860s, 1850s, 1860s is more of what we picture when we think of a corset. Because honestly a lot of people, their first thought is they think Victorian when they think of a corset. That's just how it is because you know, steampunk and not like... And let's be honest, Queen Victoria had insane amounts of influence on the fashion world and what's popular so kudos to her so stays get longer the silhouette changes there is more emphasis on bringing in the waistline cinching it in um, and really it's an illusion more than anything so you would think that you know it looks like they're just like just tight lacing themselves up so tight and they can't breathe and they're just like squeezing all their guts in and they're not that's not what's happening it's all an illusion really <laughs> the whole silhouette is an illusion <laughs> so there are some actually fabulous examples of these beautiful Victorian corsets at the Al Victorian Albert Museum in England and someday oh someday <laughs> someday I will get to go and admire the beauty so as the century moved on um, corsets and stays they started to move more downward they started to lose some of the boning um, what we know is the Victorian corset it actually became like went below the hips so it got so far down it's called a long line corset and sometimes they didn't even like go over the cup they actually would be under the bust line um, and these ones were just more for holding you in. They didn't actually like have a ton of like a ton of boning and support and things to like try and kill you. Like they weren't trying to do that. They could move relatively well, but it was all about the silhouette because the skirts had thinned out. Um, the silhouette was a lot thinner, longer, leaner, um, and not that full poofy skirt and the hips and all that. There was more of an emphasis on bringing out the S figure of a woman's 
body so it was emphasizing the butt <laughs> and the boobs so what we see into the beginning of the 20th century is a lot more a lot more comparable to uh, like girdles in the 40s and 50s essentially so for examples of corsets and stays that I personally have and I'm talking about this also because of the fact that I'm actually making an Edwardian stay right now. Um, well, <laughs> obviously not right now, not at this very moment because I'm talking to your beautiful faces. But I have been working on this project and I'm going to show you. So this lovely piece is an Edwardian stay. It's actually going to be, um, it should have front closure, but I didn't have a long enough busk. And you know, that's how it is. <laughs> so, this is, it doesn't have the boning in. I have all the channels in, but I don't have the boning in. But you can kind of see sort of the shape that it's sort of going for. But it goes down here below my hips. And this one actually does go up over my boobs. See? But it's coming. It's coming along. <sighs> but the thing that's lovely about this is it's actually super lightweight. And I'm actually going to be using a uh, spiral steel boning so I think that it'll be really supportive flexible I can move well in it I think it'll be perfect um, but the thing that you can see with this one because it doesn't have all the boning and stuff in it there is actually sections where there is no boning so it but I caught it cut the silk and the muslin, I cut it on the bias, um, and there's actually a, it's the use of the fabric and the way that you cut the fabric, it's all about engineering the item. And that's how you don't get a whole bunch of bunching and stuff. Obviously it doesn't look that way when I put it up because it's not boned, but you know, you get the idea. So I lined this. So the interfacing, I just used a cotton muslin, and then the lining, I used cotton muslin. <laughs> so there's three layers, um, and then the outer layer is actually a silk taffeta. And it's a really pretty light peach. You can't really tell, but there it is. I love it! And it may look really tacky, but it's more historically correct, I guess. I ran out of cream-colored binding tape, so I used black. But it's going to be covered by more lining, so who cares. <laughs> and then I'm going to show you my Victorian corset. This one I actually got on Amazon, so it's not super historically correct, but it's not bad. It's made with cotton and canvas, so... It's actually pretty decent for Amazon, but I'm gonna I'm gonna just tell you this now. My other fellow historic costumers, please tell me if this has happened to you. I'm sure it has, <laughs> but I actually broke the busk. It snapped in half while I was wearing this item. So just so you know, and I have a scar about right here. <laughs> to prove it. So I still had a shift on under it, but it, the steel busk snapped in half and I wore it like that for far too long. But this is actually the corset that you have seen me wear in other things before. Well, it's laced right now, so I can't necessarily get it on. But <clears throat> I'll post a picture of you so you can see 
more of what it is. But it has a beautiful shape. Honestly, it's not too bad for Amazon. So. So I'm talking about all of this corset, stays, silhouettes, women changing their body shape and how they would, you know, wear these things for centuries. And you're probably wondering, what is it like wearing a corset or a stay? Well, I wear a stay for my job and um, I, so I actually work doing living history demonstration type of stuff in Dallas and I wear full historic garments so I actually wear all of the correct underpinnings, the correct shoes, everything and I have run, I have walked, I have washed clothes by hand, I have washed wool, I have built fires, I have cooked over an open fur. I have cooked over an open fire <laughs> in an open hearth <laughs> and I have cleaned, I have lifted, I have chopped wood and I've done all of it in a corset. So many things I have been able to do completely laced up in my corset and it has been totally fine. So, you can do things, it's not completely constricting. There have been so many stories throughout the years that have circulated about essentially kind of like bad mouthing corsets. And I, I think that it probably more has to do with the fact that like lots of people, there are those people who have the opinion that corsets are like a sign of the patriarchy and they're confining women. I don't personally agree with that. I wear a corset pretty often and I love it so um, but there have been so many stories where people have claimed that women have died died no women have died from a corset just has not happened the stories that women's organs were squished together from being and damaged from being too la tightly laced or women who have fainted and died because they were too tightly laced or that women had to have ribs removed that is just not true <laughs> it is not correct at all and there are so many different movies that give real examples of this Pirates of the Caribbean Oh. How's it come? It's difficult to say. I'm told it's the latest fashion in London. Well, women in London must have learned not to breathe. Not accurate. Bridgerton. Tighter. She to breathe, Mama. Not accurate. They were not lacing these women to the where they could not breathe. Your if you could not breathe in your corset. You needed to fix it. Yeah. That is how it's supposed to be. If you were not able to breathe and do your daily living in your corset, then you needed to go get it refitted or get a new one because it was not fit to your body. You can actually breathe quite well in a corset. Um, so actually, the way that they're fitted, I am actually wearing one right now. So the way that they are fitted is it does cinch in my waistline. It only brings it in about two inches, not a whole lot. It cinches about half an inch on my hips, um, but it actually gives me a little extra room. So it's actually more uh, gapey at the top, so it's not constricting my lungs. So if it was constricting around the rib cage, I wouldn't be able to breathe. But I could breathe just fine. <sighs> See? Just fine. So the rumor of you cannot breathe in a corset, it's just not true. I mean, if you can't breathe in a corset after running, it's probably because you're out of shape. <laughs> and like I said, I have run in a corset. I could still breathe. <laughs> but I was out of shape. <laughs> so it was labored. <laughs> so all of this is, you know good reviews of it 
But there is one thing that I have learned wearing a corset on a regular basis is the fact that um, maybe slightly TMI, but if you eat and you wear your corset all day, when you take it off, be close to a bathroom. <laughs> okay. But the reality of a corset stay is they offer fantastic back support um, and they're really helpful with building up your posture and helping to promote better posture. <laughs> there, I will be honest, there are some days where I've considered maybe I should just like wear corsets instead of bras because truthfully I hate bras. And I just, I think it's great and then like three o'clock rolls around and I just want to flop on the couch and let's be honest, Victorian women did not just flop on the couch. <laughs> It, corsets are not super helpful in flopping. So, if you are a flopper, like me, you may not want to wear one every single day. But it's not that bad, really. Do you want to wear a bra every single day? No. So, we talked about all of the corsets and stays and the way that they changed in the 19th century. I hope that you found it interesting, that it was informative, that maybe you got a few of your questions answered about curiosities about how people live in corsets. Um, and honestly, I actually really enjoy wearing them. They're super supportive and helpful, um, but I will be honest that I don't want to wear them every single day, all day. <laughs> <laughs> because I like to flop. <laughs> I am so thankful for all of you coming by to check out this new video. I hope that you'll stop by again. To all of my new subscribers, thank you so much for some subscribing. I am so eternally grateful. And to old subscribers, I am so thankful for you still. Um, please let me know if you have any suggestions or questions and things for the future. I'm open to it all. I love you all. Thanks again. Bye. There was more emphasis on like the S curve of the female figure, bringing out the boob. The boob. <laughs> Amazon should like make me a sponsor. I buy way too much stuff. <laughs> Jeff Bezos should be my friend. Okay. <laughs>